everybody. <laughs> I didn't realize we went live on Facebook. So uh, uh, thank you for joining us at the Earth Day 365 Climate Change Speaker Series, part of our Earth Day Half Birthday Week of Actions. I want to thank our sponsors, Centene, Subaru, Missouri American Water, the City of St. Louis, Metro Lighting, MSD, Project Clear, the Solid Waste Management District of St. Louis, Jefferson County, and the Missouri Department of Natural Resources, along with Great Rivers Greenway. Without their generous support, we could not have put together this Earth Day Half Birthday Week of Action. And if you missed it, Thursday was a very successful green curbside hop in our green dining district of Maplewood uh, with our Green Dining Alliance certified participating restaurants. And we organized three neighborhood cleanups this weekend sponsored by Subaru. One was in St. Louis South City in Dutchtown, up in St. Louis North County of Pine Lawn, and in Webster Groves in Deer Creek Park. I myself was in the creek today and that felt great. Uh, so climate change is not only impacting our environment, but it impacts our lives, creating stress and trauma that can debilitate our ability to be creative and empowered to connect with our community and affect change. We have four amazing speakers today, each sharing a different perspective around climate change. From uh, our first segment was with Reverend Lauren Buck addressing personal trauma and gender oppression. Uh, we just heard from Zeke Hosfather, a climate model expert looking at what is climate change and what we can do about it. And now we have David Lubbock from the Missouri Historical Society and Myra Jackson, Jackson the global lead with the uh, Global Freshwater Summit. And after them, uh, <clears throat> we will be, uh, we will have Marlo Baines, the youth director from Earth Guardians, um, talking to us about how to activate into action with it her inspiration and wisdom. I hope you can stay with us for all the segments. If you missed any of them, they are uh, going to be recorded and up on our website at earthday-365.org. If you have any questions for our speakers, uh, we'll be monitoring the Zoom chat and the Facebook live feed, so please feel free to uh, put some stuff in there. Um, and now I want to thank our partnership with the Missouri Historical Society um, that we are able to present this segment of their Our River Conversations, honoring the great rivers. Uh, first, we'll hear from David Ludwig. He was inspired by the natural environment's deeply ingrained relationship with our community. David collects artifacts and produces exhibits that explain how historic and present day decisions affect dynamic environmental change. His research examines the impact of resource exploitation on the biotic community, and it informs his mission to engage the public in equitable solutions for a sustainable society. Uh, after David speaks, Myra Jackson um, will share with us about the Global Freshwater Summit. Uh, she's a retired electrical engineer and organizational development professional who has designed and delivered seminar courses on business management, emotional intelligence, and heart coherence techniques at Harvard, Stanford, USC, UCSF, US, uh, UC San Diego, Rockefeller University, and Duke. In 2006, Myra shifted her focus to global policy on the climate crisis, and in 2015, she participated in the UN Open Working Group that determined the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Ms. Jackson currently serves on the United Nations Expert Platform on Harmony with Nature and is a delegate to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. She consults collaborative groups of governments, higher education companies, utilities, and communities developing responses to sustain the rivers and regional environments and enjoys growing into the title of Diplomat of the Biosphere. Oh, that was my ring that told me I had to stop, shut up and introduce David and Myra. Welcome. Thank you, thank you very much. Oh, it's wonderful to have such a competent and amicable host and I'm glad to hear you got out in the creek today and was cleaning up some of the wonderful watershed we have. I am going to share with you today, I'm sharing with you my screen right now, a little bit about the perspective uh, that the Mighty Mississippi exhibit at the Missouri Historical Society's History Museum has on display. It opened on the 23rd of November last year. And because of the pandemic, uh, we've had you know some ups and downs with being open and being accessible to the public, but it is open now and, and you can make arrangements to see that exhibit uh, either on, um, on our website, through our website, uh, mohistory.org or uh, calling and uh, making arrangements to 
for a timed entry so that uh, they can manage how many people are in that gallery at any given time. They do wonderful uh, work keeping it clean and, and safe for everybody. So um, the exhibit will be up until uh, the very early part of June of next year. And uh, there's a lot to see there. Uh, there's probably enough to, to, to be uh, in that gallery probably four times to see the, all, the, all the marvelous uh, uh, aspects of our history. So today I wanted to talk about um, how that gives us an insight into to climate change and uh, how you know caring for uh, this river by knowing it uh, can probably uh, really put us a leg up on, on uh, surmounting our climate crisis. So uh, the 6,000 square foot exhibit has uh, images and media and 250 artifacts to tell the story of our river heritage. And it gives us our clues about the future, uh, I think, by looking at our past. Some of these objects go back, way back in time, a thousand years and even more, uh, almost uh, 7,000 years or more. Uh, so, uh, you know, you'll get a treat because so many of them have never been exhibited before at all. And uh, there are also these great deep dives into 65 different interactive video interview segments that you can that give voice to current issues and you can understand more about where people are thinking from their professional and, and intimate uh, relationships with the river today. So <clears throat> I think uh, places where we really have to start in, in considering you know, climate change and, and our, our, our communities, place in, in this natural world where we find ourselves uh, underlies all our successes and failures. And when we disconnect ourselves from place, we as a culture take on great risks and radical challenges. So knowing that this river, this watershed system is tens of thousands of years old is really uh, uh, helpful I think in, in appreciating its magnitude. It's really North America's greatest river. It's a foundation for civilizations for more than a thousand years. It's the largest and most influential uh, American Indian center back in the Mississippian period that was built here at Cahokia. And it's a vast net, uh, network uh, for Europeans and Native Americans in the fur trade uh, period uh, in which uh, Europeans were colonizing the continent. And then it became this, this great immigration route for um, many, many people in the industrial age through steamboats. It's really a river world worth caring for. And as, uh, you know, as social creatures, uh, people, we're, we connect and bind another, one another through ideas and stories and that we share with one another, another, another about who we are and who we want to be. The stories we tell ourselves shape how we think about our lives and where and how we live, how we treat each other. So a lot of that can be seen in, you know, this place and how we tell stories of this place and who we are in this place. Um, it's an incredibly important to our survival, I think, to, to have this perspective. And, you know, like with the pandemic, the climate crisis is a new opportunity to see these problems and solutions that we share and realign ourselves with the rest of the living world. These are some shots of the, of the gallery before people started wearing masks. Uh, we can look at uh, to those who came before us in this region to see examples of how civilization functions and can function and has functioned in the past. Uh, cities, information, uh, compassionate skills and arts, even religion are preserved and passed on in a civilized world. And in the first people's world here, the, the second uh, section of the exhibit, uh, you see a great civilization that emerged before the present one. And you can explore that, this Mississippian period, as I said, uh, as exemplified by Cahokia Mound State Historic Site just across the river near Collinsville, Illinois, is uh, a remnant of that, but that culture was all over in our region on this side of the river, the west side of the Mississippi as well, up and down the Mississippi, up the Missouri, the Merrimack, uh, all these rivers were net together in this, uh, in this uh, community of uh, Mississippian period culture as we know it today. So uh, with its many tri tributaries, it was, uh, the river system was a compelling trade route really. Uh, you know, it's how people got around in the mid continent and that's what caused this flowering of, of this civilization. Uh, the people who lived here, you know, at that time, lived in probably a much more intimate relationship with this world, uh, this natural world than we are, are privileged to have today because they, they were in it all the time, constantly. 
And now we have, you know, these, this built environment that we retreat too often. So it was also a place in which uh, the civilization was really founded in the floodplains, uh, the rich and fertile environments of the floodplains. And uh, that gave them a, a leg up on agriculture, which is on, on which civilizations are built. Hey, David. So, yes. When you uh, take a look at the Mississippi River, there's a, a huge like valley that spans all the way from the arch eastward, isn't there? That was the old Mississippi. And when you talk about floodplains, are people familiar with that? That's what you're not only the present day Mississippi, but also the ancient kind of glacial Mississippi being like a whole floodplain and different. Do you talk about that? Or yes. Uh, that in your exhibit? Yeah. So I would have loved to have gone more into the glacial period, but of course, you know, that's, that's pretty remote and geological for some people. They want to, you know, know a, 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 a human history as much as possible. And of course people were here, you know, 11,000 years ago when this was all thawing out from the last ice age, people were here hunting and gathering and, and it, it's really in that Mississippian period beginning, you know, about a thousand years ago as well, um, that, you know, people start to really settle down. They, they did in the previous era before that, the woodland period, but it, um, they start really taking advantage and becoming sedentary in this region. And that floodplain you're talking about, that valley, as you put it, it's really the um, floodplain of the Mississippi to the east of St. Louis is called the American Bottom. And it roughly, you know, it starts up near Alton, south of Alton and goes down to uh, down Chester, Illinois. And it's, and it's where the river has meandered back and forth and claimed certain portions of it for a channel. So the channel isn't something static, you know, from the glacial age to the present, um, the river wants to move. It wants to go to the least path of least resistance. This is a, a geo um, physical mechanical aspect of, of um, how the land lays and how water wants to move. And you, and you really can't knock that. Of course, we do engineer now so that we move the water on um, through um, other means, you know, through dredging and, and, and channelization and so forth. But Yeah, because I, I heard that like the Mississippi, I mean, could you have walked across it at some point? Was the channel so deep always? Like now it's what, yeah. average 12 feet or something like that? Uh, you'd probably have, you're right. You'd have to go back uh, eons to walk across it, unless it was the winter time. Now, it used to freeze solid um, during more colder periods in history, and uh, actually as recently as the 19th century, um, early 20th, um, it did freeze when there wasn't uh, river traffic, like big barges, steel barges and towboats that we have today, pushing, creating uh, uh, breakage through the ice and uh, uh, so people did uh, uh, walk or travel across it and, and when it was frozen at, at different years at, but in terms of it being shallow enough to go across I think it's been a, a pretty long time <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah no I get that I just I just also think about um, like when I lived up in Alaska I saw really braided rivers and so mm -hmm. one system you know actually had many little tributaries that you and and would like Mark Twain like sharing his stories about all these different kind of braids or the channel right. changing all the time in his writings? Right. Yeah, it certainly did do that. And islands were created uh, quite frequently and swept away depending on you know the flood flooding seasons. And and uh, so uh, to the south of uh, the Ohio River, it becomes a much more braided river. It was a much more braided river. Nowadays, it's managed as a wide deep channel for uh, cargo, for commercial tra uh, barge traffic. Uh, the river's characteristics are very different depending on where you are. I mean, you're in Minnesota, you can walk across it up at Lake, Lake Itasca. Uh, but uh, around here, it, it isn't characteristically a braided river as much as it would be to the south of here. We do have sort of a, a, a bluff and floodplain uh, world here in the middle Mississippi River. Yeah. So the, the braided portion has changed. There are some marvelous maps uh, that you can see that, that were done in the 1940s that, that uh, help us see how, how that was. So I'll uh, roll through the other couple of sections of this exhibit and talk a little bit about the relationship with our history and 
climate change, and I think where we, I hope that we go and thinking about it. So in the third section, uh, it's called the course of empires. Here we are, in the, it's the third of the fourth, and it, it addresses that colonial period when the Europeans and then Americans were coming into the river valley and, and claiming a lot of it for other purposes than it had, had been previously used by the Native Americans. And uh, it, here you see that this vast natural resource, uh, the river and everything that it, it offers um, enabled this colonization in a big way. Uh, animal furs and also minerals were part of that extraction of minerals. So it was really an extractive relationship with the river. It wasn't really, uh, you know, give and take nurturing and working with it and living with it in, a, in quite the same way as it had been previously. So um, <clears throat> the fur trade really changed and destabilized the Native American relationships with the place. And uh, St. Louis played this hugely important important role. It was at one time one of the largest cities in the United States, one of the fourth largest cities, and uh, was a major uh, port for uh, ex export of furs to Europe. So um, the fourth and final section is, is um, something called, I call the avenue of industry, where the river really becomes this avenue, right? It becomes something different than the place of the first people or the course, the small course of empires moving through, it becomes a, a super highway, if you will, for steam power and the revolution of, of steamboats, which are a product of the industrial age. And it and changes the river dramatically and irre irrevocably, at least in terms of uh, as far as we can see. Uh, so uh, steamboat travel brought in immigration. Um, African Americans were enslaved and 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 uh, put to use on these boats and also on the levees and so forth. That's a very important, significant role uh, that St. Louis and other river communities played with pay, uh, played with um, in the social uh, realm. Uh, it's often not acknowledged. And uh, so, into the 21st century, uh, river boat uh, river communities that we see were really founded on that steamboat era and when those earlier communities were established. We seem to have it pretty good today. Uh, we get much of our relationship uh, uh, with the Mississippi River watershed uh, from uh, shipping and commerce. And it seems to have only gotten better over time. You know, these statistics uh, point to how much we depend on it. There are lots of people that live here uh, and prosper because of that of the uh, river. I apologize if you can hear my dog barking. I don't know if you can. Uh, uh, so why is any of this in the past so important and how does all this inform who we are now and what we wanna be? How uh, can it help us to help one another to survive a climate crisis that is unfolding but is seemingly sometimes far away and mostly elsewhere on the planet Earth? Um, why is this any of this past so important? Uh, how does it inform, inform us? Um, is, is what I really think is you know, something to, to consider. And, and we can start by seeing who, where we are, you know, observe the constant changes, the, the ones that are normal and necessary. We're talking about the meandering river, the braided rivers. Um, some of those things are very natural and, and normal. If we don't, aren't at the river, if we don't go there often enough, we don't see many of those things. If we don't you know, observe the nature that lives around it um, and with it, uh, then we, we miss some of that stuff. Uh, so we can learn about what's important you know, by, by recognizing place and seeing, seeing the nature here. We can also uh, see ourselves in context, uh, not just in a uh, place <laughs> such as this here at the confluence of all these rivers, but also in time. And by examining the lives of those who came before us, we can recognize you know, their hopes and dreams. Um, and uh, our, recognize ours and theirs even, and see how they succeeded and failed and even find them, you know, striving to do uh, at times um, things like, like uh, what we are doing today. So in the Mississippian period, uh, living you know, a thousand years ago or so, people chased, uh, faced these challenges and they found uh, these powerful forces and beliefs and objects like this uh, that they had for the underworld and the water world. So this is a creature that you can see here uh, on this figurine, it's called the Burger figurine. And uh, it, it also bespeaks uh, the reliance on water from the skies and from the rivers for uh, fertilizing their, their land and, uh, and giving them life and sustaining them. So many of these objects are in the exhibit. 
we can see, recognize that people had families and that we're all from families and create families and, and allies and, and, pe and have people for which, which were conflicted. And we build shelters and monuments just like they did. And uh, we find meaning and enjoyment in some days just like they did and some days not uh, uh, meaning and, or enjoyment, but we revel in some and we get sick sometimes and we die. And we can uh, learn that they too relied on this far flung network of resources um, uh, for trade and for communication. And you know, this is bringing us up into that colonial period and that much of, most of it was enabled by the <clears throat> treasure that is the river system. So there's some of the trade goods um, that are on display in the exhibit. <clears throat> so that, this is something that is you know, with us very much today. You know, this is the commerce uh, view from the view of the commerce on barges. Uh, from south of St. Louis. St. Louis is the top of that image. And this is looking downstream to uh, downtown St. Louis and the arch. But uh, time zero is not always straight and progressive. And speaking from the human perspective, uh, when we look carefully, we can see patterns of change that no one saw in earlier times. We're forced, we've uh, forced a change in the land and the river and the atmosphere and all living things that depend on these earth assets. So uh, I, I think, uh, you know, despite these successes, uh, we, you know, if you look closely, you can see that things really do change uh, over time. Their work I and mean, some things, as I said, remain the same as there were many Native American communities early on uh, that built uh, their lives in the valley. But um, uh, if you look closely, you can see how people used to live in uh, close concert with the land and water for their uh, food resources. In the Mississippian period, people built these communities because of um, uh, the rich fertile land, as I mentioned, and harvesting and planting within that land. Um, uh, literally, you know, some of their technology was cutting edge for the time. Here's a, a, a handheld hoe that was used uh, in the floodplain to uh, plant and harvest. In the colonial period, when the river was this course of empires, the long, deep understanding uh, of the river, its force and subtleties, the respect for it began to change. And many groups who had lived with it for centuries were uprooted. Uh, their knowledge and tradition, traditions were really rent asunder. And we can only begin to guess what we have lost as a result of that. So here are some of the native names for, for some of the, um, for the river from the different uh, Native American groups. And seeing the river itself as something to shape and change uh, to our will began in that age of steamboats, the industrial age that I mentioned, and to satisfy this commercial growth, forests were cleared and channels were modified and freed of, of, of obstructions and they were deepened and the boats um, were a feature of the community just as automobiles and trains are today. And with, uh, with them, we went far down a path that we hardly recognize even being on now. Uh, this is a path that was chosen and enhanced and refined over and over again uh, through multiple generations. And here are some of those uh, boats at the St. Louis levee uh, belching steam from burning coal or, or wood uh, to fuel their steam engines. Uh, they were, as I said, uh, you know, a really feature of the, of the community. And uh, here's the anatomy of one of those boats. So you can see the heart of, it, of the engine, its boiler, um, that was fueled uh, by uh, 12 to 24 cords every 24 hours, uh, cords of wood, and uh, larger boats consumed even more uh, energy, and had to consume more trees. So as you can imagine, with those trees coming down off the riverbanks, uh, there was a tremendous amount of loss to the river in its character. Uh, the river became more shallow, it uh, tended to so the banks subsided and fell in. And uh, it set us on this, this path of having to channelize the river and keep it clear and of obstructions for the steamboats uh, that were you know, actually causing the obstructions to occur. Uh, so the Army Corps of Engineers became involved in the 1830s and Congress began funding this, this sort of cycle of, uh, of uh, trying to manage the, the, the changing river and keep it static and the same and, and, and try to keep it preserved for, for the, um, the boat's use. So this was also that period you know, when St. Louis boomed 
it became this huge community and many other communities sprung up around it. This is the view of St. Louis in the, the early 1850s. Um, another view a little bit later in the 1870s, lots of pollution in the atmosphere, right? From burning coal and, and wood. Um, so this is, you know, this is where we are kind of today is, is set on the path by that era, but it also, as I said, started us into this management, um, river management condition where we manage the floodplains for uh, development. We encroach upon them uh, on the river with, with levees. Uh, we don't understand holistically the risks involved. Uh, and only into the 1970s did we start to appreciate that. So this, is, this has changed the river dramatically. Uh, in the 1850s, there was knowledge by some, some engineers in the Army Corps that recognized this in the 1920s. Some others were you know, calling out a, a little bit of an alarm about this. And in the 1970s, Charlie Belt at St. Louis University uh, did some studies that, that proved that this was, this was this, this cha changing the river, the channelization and, and levying of it was actually making things worse for us for flooding. So um, here's some images of the, of the floodplain. As you mentioned earlier, uh, Bob, that orange area, that's floodplain. So St. Louis is high and dry, Alton's high and dry, St. Charles is high and dry, but the counties and the areas around them that are, that are colored in orange here are floodplains and those little red lines are the levees that we've created to try to keep the rivers out of those floodplains. So Bob, uh, Chris uh, wrote a few years ago that since 1993, uh, five of the eight highest floods uh, have occurred at St. Louis since 93, five of the eight highest. And uh, since 2013, three of the highest floods. So Dave, really you even, if I could add mm -hmm. in there, like one of your slides talked about um, levees being above uh, policy height or, or design. Yes. Can you yes. explain that right. and how that's impacting us? Yeah, that's a really difficult nut to crack. Um, so, you know, in, in uh, overall national policy, federal policy, the Army Corps of Engineers has that authority to approve uh, levy heights. They don't build all the levees. It's not their you know, job to do that. They do build some, but it's not, um, it's typically districts that do that. Uh, sometimes it's uh, agricultural districts or communities that want to keep themselves from being flooded. And what's that, what that's done is it's kind of created a, a, you know, a rush like it was a few years ago to the big box store, you know, inviting them in to you know, get higher revenue. You build a levy and you've got more security for the revenue that you're getting off of the agricultural area or the, the community that's been built there and secures it uh, or, or move, moves towards securing it. Um, and uh, so if everybody's building one of these, everyone's trying, striving for a higher levy to keep the river out of their community, it's pushing the river into the next community upstream. Um, it's causing floods elsewhere. And the Sny, uh, Sny Levy District in Illinois is one of those uh, problematic levees. It's built above height. So you mentioned being built above height. Sometimes this happens. <laughs> Sometimes it happens accidentally, I guess, or uh, at least without the knowledge of the core and or approval of the core. And sometimes the core approves it, gets built differently, or uh, you know, they, or they haven't checked and fully after it's done. And you know, what do you do after it's been built? So it's it's a it's a problematic thing where we do not have overarching policy and, and agreements uh, across state lines, across community lines, that help us understand we're all in this together. This is all, you know, this is commons. These are the commons. They're in the United States, the rivers are the commons, one, some of the commons, and uh, as is the air. And it, it, it is uh, essential that we uh, recognize that and help each other uh, with, with uh, our safety and security in that. Um, so private property rights have really disrupted some of, some of this uh, thinking. Um, but private property rights are there to protect everyone, really. They're really meant to, if they're, if they're managed well. And, and I think that, you know, one of the things you could critique historically is how well those have been managed, especially in recent years. So those rights. So, yeah, so that's a, that's a problem. Uh, it's not the cause of all the flooding. Uh, well, it is the cause of the majority of the flooding. And we know that climate change is also going to bring, you know, some of that flooding. So that's why the sli current slide is up. Uh, that, you know, according to the National Climate Assessment in 2018, we're in for a three to eight foot increase in flood level rise 
um, by 2050. And, uh, you know, we're going to be looking, you know, greater precipitation or extreme precipitation events. There's more dynamics, more change, more disruption, more less predictability. <clears throat> so this is a bad prescription for future sustained habitation in these floodplains. You're going to see like this in 2017, the flood uh, near Alton, Illinois. You can see all the way to the Missouri River. And it's flooded all over the place there. Uh, this in 2012, we had drought conditions and exposed the, the 19th century uh, pilings that were used to manage the river channel. So we'll see more of those. And they, these are just in recent uh, recent years that those have happened. So uh, I'm sorry, I didn't want to go on about all the negative stuff. But if you see the history and think about it and look at these subtle changes over time, you realize that there's sort of some patterns that are developed out of behavior that were inadvertent. Nobody probably intended for any of this to happen. But if you can step back and look at place in time and think about it a little bit more, you see how, how that can be um, problematic for our, our future, for our descendants, for the community as it, as it will be in the future. So um, this is one of those things, those practices that we don't do so much anymore, dump garbage on the levee. The Shoto's pond was uh, highly polluted by that lead factory right there and cows defecating in it. That was drained. I'm sorry, that was drained. Actually, the problem was the pollution that people were committing to. But we have changed some of our practices. We do pay attention to, there are aspects of our culture that pay attention to these needs and purposes. So uh, this is a photograph from the 1930s, uh, one of the wetlands that had been now um, uh, eliminated and managed um, out of really existence uh, in the Mississippi River, a, a, a nature study group there. Our, our whole community is founded on this concept of, you know, the, this is a great place to be. This is the trading point during the fur trade. And our flag represents that. That's the Missouri and Mississippi River coming together under the bezel of that colonial uh, fleur de lis of the French. Um, these are the things that, you know, matter. And I uh, really, if we're going to have a sustained community, and I think, you know, looking more closely at some of the bellwether species like freshwater river mussels, giving empathy for species other than ourselves and for ourselves, recognizing that if these birds perish, these are the stats that are down on all these uh, many migratory birds in the area that migrate, migrate along the Mississippi River, uh, we need to to recognize that they are our community members as well. And when we take care of them, we, we take care of ourselves as well and secure our future. So our engagement begins at home with our families and our children and with our neighbors and commuting to support even the weakest members of society and, and, and various species. And I, I think, you know, with the possibility of a new narrative, such as the exhibit helps us begin by looking at our history, begin to tell our story to ourselves. So we have a story that makes sense, that's more comprehensive, that's more thoughtful about what the, the river means to us and, and, and how we are going to, I hope, live with it in the long term. So uh, please go and see it at the Missouri Historical Society's History Museum in Forest Park until uh, June of, early June of 2021. And um, I'm sorry, I hope I haven't taken too much of your time, Myra, I'll turn it over to you. Fantastic presentation, David. You've done such a wonderful job. And this is why I appreciate so much the partnership that uh, we have with the museum. And you're absolutely right. Looking back at that news, that history can allow us to take stock and can allow us also to decide how we want to go forward with what we know now, because the science is pretty strong. And not only the science, we can see it and feel it, um, what's what's happening, the, the direction of our world. And so, Bob, I want you just before I begin to speak, tell me how many minutes I have and I'll make it work. Yeah, you've uh, got about 10 minutes. Okay. All right. I'm just going to pop really quickly into, uh, if I can bring it up, my not so much of a presentation other than a few guideposts. <clears throat> and um, I did have it up at one point, so I may need to go back out here really quick because it looks like I, I got rid of it. 
And uh, in the meantime, uh, while meantime, you're getting that you together, that. I will just say, David, amazing. I just love your wit, breadth, and knowledge of the river uh, historically and to present day. You know, and I even think just about, you know, rainfall and the sponge of earth uh, collecting water and how when we have yards and pavement, um, it increases flooding events because that storm water runs off. And so it's so important to have projects um, that create rain gardens and um, planting to native plants in our yards, which are going on all over the right. place, get rid of grass and let water you know, sink into the earth and then seep into our riverways rather than pouring down the storm drains and stuff. stuff. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Every, every stream counts, really. It's all part of a network. It's not a line on a map. As I, you know, the Mississippi River is not one single line on a map. No, it's not one single line on the, on the map. And it's not separate from who and what we are. And, uh, you know, I've been really thinking about how each person walking is a representation of the rivers in which lives have been nurtured throughout time. And so I really, what I want to do is just note this day. I want you all to remember this day. This day is going into my, uh, my scrapbook because I've been, um, since 2006, working on these concerns, the concerns of around climate change and I've been doing it because of three dreams that came to me um, in the 80s, in the late 80s and continued into the 90s. And they were from grandchildren I didn't have, great, great, great grandchildren. They seemed to be way out there. And the content of the dreams were always the same. Grandma, what did you do when you knew the earth was in peril? And I began sharing this in circles that I was a part of until ultimately once climate change became this reality, I knew why I was being asked that question. Because it really does matter what I choose to do in recognizing the earth in peril. The choices I make do matter and who I bring along with me in that matters. And we are in that time. I think it's upon us where we do need to make a choice about how we're going to be in relationship with the earth and how we're gonna turn the might we have in our intellect and our hands and hearts to get busy, um, to work toward building a world that is, is respectful and uh, in harmony with the earth itself. And there's no reason we can't do that. This day going on here right now is your half birthday for Earth Day, Bob, is it marks really what began over 50 years ago, shortly after we got wind of what it looked like to have an image of our world from space. And I'm old enough to have lived through that and have been deeply impacted by seeing those early images from space. When I really got it, this is our home and we share it. You can't divide it up and think what happens in any given part of the world is not going to have an impact on the whole. And that has been, um, it's been a part of what's in the background. It underlies how I think and the decisions I've made since then. And so I'm marking this day because I'm thinking a lot about not only 2050, but because of my age, 2030. And because of, of the importance of us turning as a society very swiftly in a direction toward recovery of planetary systems. We don't have a chance to wait. We need to be doing it now. And the good news is that is what's happening. This kind of activity, people spending a Sunday afternoon at Earth Day 365 is an indication societally of something we know and that we're responding to. So I just want you to mark that day because I am. It matters the company we keep right now and the choices we're making. Uh, David spoke to the industrial age. He showed you that, that uh, avenue of commerce 
that mark the industrial age. A lot happened during industrialization. A lot happened during colonization. And the thinking is still with us. We lost the capitalization of nature. We turned nature into an object, literally in our language. So I have worked to restore that capitalization of nature using the capital in so that we realize this is something that we're in relationship with. How we do language has a lot to do with how we frame our thinking, how we view our circumstances, and how we walk in our lives. So the Global Freshwater Summit is coming out of our human story, a story that's very much about water. We have an earth that is a watery planet covered by 71% water. And few people know of that, that less than 1% represents the fresh waters that flow in the lakes and rivers and wetlands of our world. That's it, less than 1%. The rest of that 2.5% that represent fresh water is caught up in the ice cap and the glacial ice. And of course it's melting, but we don't have very good plans in place as we see melt to actually capture it as fresh water, it's going into the sea. And so what we're hoping to lift up in the summit with our partners, the Missouri History Museum being one of our key partners, is to honor the freshwater biomes and our relationship to it. And I emphasize the biome because we're not just talking about the channel that we think of as the way in which we move product up and down or the food that we take out of the river. It is a habitat for many, many species. Many species that represent biodiversity on this planet, which is key, like the fresh waters, biodiversity is one of the key planetary boundaries of the Earth system. There are nine, and the fresh waters of those nine are the most regenerative, which means if we care for the river, help to restore the health of the river, it has an exponential effect on what it can do to help us recover the atmosphere and to recover the uh, earth systems related to fresh water biomes, the habitat, the biodiversity, and so on. And so with this movement of this summit, we are joined with the idea that it's time to turn back to the river, to reconnect, to reestablish a great honoring of the river. And I show this slide because a few years back in 2012, a scientist uh, Helen uh, Siazio was looking at what was going on in New Zealand at the Wangui River and the peoples there and saw that those narratives were intertwined with a goal of decolonizing people and nature. And that what it demonstrates is that the sovereignty of the people is interconnected with the Wangui River. And this was a, uh, an observation that by the native peoples of New Zealand that they said, whomever this woman is, she understood our plight and what we are trying to achieve. And I throw that into our conversation because around the world, there is a rights of nature movement that is really focused on restoring our relationship to the rivers and doing so through Western law. So there is an evolution underway in Western law to recover the rights. And in recovering the rights, if we look at that in terms of the, the kawa, which are the laws that indigenous people live by, and in New Zealand is called the tepua te kawa, that they are seeing the river as an indivisible entity that has physical and metaphysical uh, attributes and that they have an axiomatic relationship with, meaning it's absolutely self-evident that the two rise together. 
And I remember David, we were in a meeting recently and he was talking about a dear friend of mine. He didn't know he was speaking to him, third person, a historian and so on, Thomas, you know, um, Barry and, and this beautiful being who's no longer living talked a lot about the three basic rights of earth community. And so a lot of what the summit is bringing in is an opportunity for us as an earth community, as people of the earth community to look at our relationship to the river and determine together through a resolution honoring these great rivers, how we now will choose to be in relationship and what are we willing to do in standing up for that relationship? We need to see the health and well being of the river change radically in a short time. And one of the good things we know is that when our behavior changed since COVID, that we can see tremendous change in the well being of the river. This is a Trata River in Colombia, now has its rights. These places that are moving in this direction are doing so because they understand something intrinsic about our relationship to the river, that there's no way that our well-being can be realized or our existence be secure in the world unless we figure out as a human society how to live within the order and proportion, beauty and harmony, resilience of the earth system. And so through the summit, what we're looking to is to open up into this uh, wonderful, uh, radical partnership amongst those who are already working in a very impassioned way on establishing a healthy river system. But not only a healthy river system, but are also looking to establish and give place for people who have been displaced in the current systems that we um, that prevail. And so we have a lot of work to do because that involves food systems, it involves social justice, it involves equity on many levels, it involves a transformation of our economic, economic system. And so we're on for a big adventure. And as with any big adventure, it's uh, there are challenges along with it but there's no place I'd rather be than right now moving forward in this accelerated fashion with all of you. And the summit is going to become a way that we have of, of channeling and harnessing all that energy toward this end. So the people's resolution is in a zero draft form. And one of the things I want to say to the audience with us today and who will listen later, please get your hands on the resolution, read it, feel for yourself what that means for you. And if there is something missing, make it your business to let us know and add your voice and add the voice of nature and that which you care for into this resolution. Let's make it something that we all feel uh, that we can commit to and work together on and sign at the summit itself. April 23rd to 25th, we're coming together and we're doing that at the Missouri History Museum. We'll be doing that uh, any way that COVID allows, virtually, some live, some virtual, all virtual, whatever we will do, we will have this summit and we will leave behind a corridor of action from summit to sea, focused on honoring the rivers and focused on doing what we must to restore this beautiful earth system. It has a code, it has a design, and we have grown up enough through looking at our missteps in the past we can reconcile those and turn our nose in a direction to ensure that future generations will have an earth system that they can enjoy. So I invite you all to join us as we move into conversations around the state of the river, reconnecting to the rivers, lifestyles in harmony with nature, recognition of the rights of rivers and governance of our river systems. We're gonna have all the partners 
<laughs> that are active in this space. And some of them are already beginning to collaborate to shape the conference to make sure we're not missing any key communities and key conversations that need to happen. Earth Day 63, 65, you helped to kick us off today. Well, I'm so, so happy about that. Here. And I, uh, I wish, but we have to get uh, ended here. Okay, and, we're uh, gonna end it here. And this was like so amazing, David and Myra, uh, for re-inviting us to re-examine ourselves and our human story about the earth and water, which perhaps we should call ourselves planet water. Um, you know, I asked about the look of the ancient Mississippi River because sometimes we need to know that there can be another vision of how water can be important and sacred in our lives. And we do not need to settle for the status quo. So I'm really excited about the Global Freshwater Summit coming. Uh, to St. Louis and your involvement with that. Um, and But we have to end the meeting here and please join us at four o'clock uh, for Marlo Baines, the youth director with Earth Guardians. Once again, thanks to our sponsors, Centene, Subaru, Missouri American Water, the City of St. Louis, Metro Lighting, MSD Project Clear, Solid Waste Management District and Missouri Department of Natural Resources and Great Rivers Greenway, this fantastic partnership with Missouri Historical Society and the History Museum. Please go see the exhibit that David has put together. It's wonderful. Um, Without the generous support of our sponsors, we cannot put together this Earth Day half birthday week of actions. Thanks for being with us, everybody. Um, thank you, David. Thank you, Myra. So thank great you. to have you here. Thank you. Bye. Yeah.